Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Hi Israel, welcome to our studio in the basement of the Albright Institute in Jerusalem. Today we're going to look back at a lot of the topics that we've covered in recent conversations, but from a different angle. Let's start with the biblical narrative of the conquest of Canaan. Tell us a little bit about the biblical side of this and let's see where it takes us. Yeah, we cannot uh, speak about the rise of ancient Israel without mentioning the biblical narrative, right? The Bible has a very clear concept about Canaan, about the conquest of Canaan. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, here is Canaan. There is a description of the land of Canaan with borders of the land of Canaan. And then it says, within these borders of the land of Canaan, this part had been conquered. And this part is left to be conquered in the future. That land, the land that remains to be conquered. And then the Bible says another thing. Even within the territory which ostensibly was conquered, Canaanite cities are still there, leftovers, if you wish, of Canaanite life. And the Bible sees this as a problem theologically because according to the biblical authors, these Canaanites living in the midst of the Israelites at the end of the day will bring them to sin. So this is the framework of the story from both geography and theology of the biblical concept of Canaan. So in the biblical narrative of the Exodus and, and the, the arrival of the Israelites, when does this conquest supposedly take place? So in the biblical concept, it is very clear. There is the uh, phase of Egypt, then there is Exodus, then there is the wandering in the desert, the coming into the land, conquest, and after a while, the establishment of the kingdom, of the big united monarchy, the great united monarchy of the time of David and Solomon. So we are trapped there somewhere in the 13th century BC, and indeed, this works well ostensibly with what we know from outside sources, extra-biblical sources, especially the Merneptah Stili, which mentions the, a group of people named Israel already in the land here, in the land of Canaan, in the very late 13th century BC. So uh, we can uh, ostensibly focus on the second half of the 13th century. Right, so it sounds like the issue has been solved long ago. You know, Albright, for example, uh, who gave his name to this place, um, it all fit for him. The conquest, the destructions at the end of the Late Bronze Age, the, uh, the arrival of Israelites, it all fit seamlessly together. Perfect. Great. Sounds perfect because we have on one hand the description of the conquest of Canaan by Joshua, which means the replacement of the uh, old system uh, of city-states, uh, Canaanite city-states with the Israelites uh, uh, in the land. And then in parallel we have evidence from archaeology of big destructions of cities at the end of the Bronze Age, at the end of the 13th century, which ostensibly connect well with the information on uh, at the city of Ramses in the story of uh, Exodus and the evidence from the Merneptah Stili. The information comes from different angles and they all fit together. So why are we having this conversation? They don't fit. And they don't <laughs> fit because of uh, two reasons, uh, but well, many reasons. Some of them come from the Bible and some of them come from archaeology. So let me start very quickly with listing the problems that come from the biblical text. First and foremost, we know already that the Bible does not know about the late Bronze Age. The Bible has no recollection of this phase with Egypt ruling over Canaanite city-states. The Bible does not know about the crisis at the end of the Bronze Age, about the climate uh, crisis, the dry period at the end of the Bronze Age. So this is one problem. The recollection of the Bible perhaps goes back to 
vaguely to events that took place in the 10th century BC, but not in the 13th or 12th centuries. We don't have any evidence for that. Secondly, there is the question of the preservation of the memory. We know very well that the book of Joshua was composed not earlier than the late 7th century BC. We also know that there is no evidence for possibility of composition of literary text in the two Hebrew kingdoms bef before around 800 BC. So we are left with a long gap if indeed we are speaking about an event that events that took place in the 13th century, how was the memory or the tradition transmitted orally over many centuries until put in uh, writing in the 7th century BC? Very difficult question. 400 years. If not more. And then we have another question that gives us some sort of a clue that we have a problem here. In Joshua, there is no conquest of Transjordan. Well, here and there, there is memory in the uh, reference in chapter 13, but there is no conquest story. Whereas we know that the, in other places in the Bible, there is conquest in Transjordan. And we know that the northern kingdom of Israel ruled over, no, the, over Transjordan. So how, how can we understand this together? So this is from the side of the Bible. Archaeology poses even more problematic issues. The first one is that many, very simple. As excavations continued after the early phase of Albright and his colleagues, it became crystal clear that many of the sites which are mentioned in the conquest narrative in the book of Joshua were not inhabited at all, did not exist in the late Bronze Age. Uh, there are many examples. I, for instance, which is anyway a problematic name, but I'm giving you one example. And then other places were not important at all at that time. In, among the places mentioned in the book of Joshua. And there is another problem that with the advances in dating, in chronology, we have a very clear view today of the destruction of the city-states of Canaan at the end of the Bronze Age. And this destruction took about a century, if not a century and a half. If we pull back to the earlier site, Hazor, we are somewhere in the middle of the 13th century, and then if we turn from Hatzor to the site that two of us are excavating at Megiddo, over there the final blow, the final destruction of the city is sometimes close to 1100 BC. So evidently we are not dealing with the general walking and destroying cities over a phase of a century and a half. The conquest of Joshua then is not historical? No, the conquest is not an historical description. It's not a description of a unified military conquest of Canaan in the 13th century BC. This does not mean that somebody was sitting in Jerusalem in the 7th century BC and inventing, inventing stories. It doesn't work that way. So I think that in front of us we have some sort of a collection of what I can describe as memories, legends, tales, and the theological stories. I wish to concentrate on the memories and the theological stories. The memories are not necessarily from the 13th century BC. In the Bible, in many places, we have what I would call accumulation of memories. Some of them may come from an earlier period. Some of them may originate from a slightly later. For instance, I for one think that some of the memories in the book of Joshua may preserve you know, uh, tradition from the 10th century BC. Not much earlier, but why not, from the 10th century. And then there are the etiological stories. What are they? This is the German tradition of explaining things, especially in research of the beginning of the 20th century, that there are items in the landscape that call the attention of the people of Israel during the time of the two Hebrew kingdoms, and they started telling stories, legends about them. For instance, there was this big pile of stones uh, of a destroyed city 
from the Bronze Age sometime near the town of Bethel. And the people of Bethel asked the question, what are we seeing here? I'm re uh, referring here to the uh, place named Ai in the Bible. And then they started telling a story about it. Well, let us explain how this large city uh, was destroyed and became a ruin. So these are the, the etiological stories. So to answer your question again in a very short, concise way, we are dealing with a collection of traditions and tales and legends and etiological stories and even maybe some memories. So we have somebody putting all of these stories and tales together, but for what reason and why, why into the package that we have now? First of all, we need to focus on the date because then the date will, should reveal the, the purpose of the writing, of the composition. We are in the late 7th century BC in the book of Joshua. There are many clues in the book of Joshua for dating the material to the late 7th century. Let me give you one example which is very well known. Joshua 15, the list of towns of uh, the tribe of Judah. Uh, we know today, I mean, f we have known for a century now that we are dealing here with an administrative division of the kingdom of Judah in the time of King Josiah in the late 7th century. So to answer your question, we need to focus on the late 7th century. So we're putting the composition of Joshua into the late 7th century. What is happening around this time that would help us understand the why of composing Joshua and the conquest? We need to look at the geopolitics. The Northern Kingdom is no more. 720 BC, the Assyrian Empire took over the Northern Kingdom. There is good reason to believe that this brought about sentiments in Judah of uh, this pan-Israelite idea that Judah now must replace Israel and the king of Judah, a Davidite king from Jerusalem, must rule over the entire people of Israel, the two old Hebrew kingdoms together, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. But this is impossible to fulfill because the Assyrian Empire is sitting there and Judah is a compliant vassal of the Assyrian Empire. However, around 630 BC for reasons that do not, uh, are not linked to the events here in the Southern Levant, the Assyrian Empire is pulling out from this region. And King Josiah uh, has this idea that the time has come now to fulfill the pan-Israelite ideology and take over the territories of the north. So I think that the story in the book of Joshua should be understood on this background, that the conquest, in fact, is a conquest to be rather than a, an historical, a description of an historical event. And there is another clue in the text itself in this direction. I refer to the idea of a biblical scholar, Kyle MacArthur, from 40 years ago. He pointed out two similarities in the text, in the description of the figure of Joshua to the description of the king, Josiah. So Joshua is described almost as a figure of a king, and uh, Joshua is a forerunner of Josiah, if you wish, and Josiah is some sort of a leader and a military leader like, uh, like, like uh, Joshua. So in my opinion, the description in the book of Joshua comes from Judah in the late 7th century BC, and it uh, needs to be understood on the background of the ideology of Judah at that time, of the conquest that will come, and the rule of Judah over the territory of the two Hebrew kingdoms together. This all fits very nicely together, Josiah, Joshua, the logic, everything seems to fit, but there's, there are a few things that are bothering me. Uh, first of all, Joshua, the character, is an Ephraimite. He's from the north. What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the figure, the, the leader of the conquest is not Judahite. The leader of the conquest, Joshua, is described 
in the Bible as belonging to the tribe of Ephraim. And Ephraim is the heartland of the northern kingdom. There is another difficulty, that the entire core of the northern kingdom, I refer to the territory of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the central highlands north of Jerusalem, all the way to Shechem, Samaria, and the, and the valley, the northern valley, the Jezreel Valley, is not described in the story of the conquest of Joshua. So we are in a problem here. And now we need to try to understand what's going on. So this is the moment to bring in other conquest traditions in the Bible because there are conquest traditions in the Bible which are not in the book of Joshua. One of them, they all come from the book of Numbers, I think, the originals, and mainly from chapter 21 in Numbers. One of them is about the Beersheba Valley, the battle with the king of Arad in the south. And two of them uh, are stories of battles and conquests in Transjordan. So I think the, the map is important here. Take the traditions of the battles and conquests, the main traditions, and plot them on a map. And what you get? You get, in fact, a description of the conquest of the land, not all of it, but from the core of the northern kingdom to the maximal borders of the northern kingdom in the 9th and 8th centuries BC. So this is an explanation of how the northern kingdom achieved its borders in Transjordan and in Cisjordan. And once you put this together with the tradition of Joshua, who, who is an Ephraimite, basically you have a northern tradition, a northern conquest tradition. So Josiah and his scribes really aren't inventing things whole cloth. They have most of the story in front of them already, and it's from the north. I think that the answer is positive not only for the conquest. I think that some of the major concepts in the Hebrew Bible that uh, which are so strong in the ideology of Judah in the 7th century BC after the fall of the northern kingdom come from the north, including the idea of a united monarchy. I suppose that we'll be speaking about it in the future and the conquest. So the scribes of Josiah, they have already a tradition of a conquest that comes from the north. And they put this tradition into the service of the ideology of Judah, of the ideology of Josiah in the late 7th century BC. But they are aware of the fact that the conquest does not describe the entire land. They are aware of the fact that a part is missing in the heartland of what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel. So what do they do? They change the genre. First, we have the genre of battles and conquest of big pieces of territory. And they turn, they insert stories about conquests of cities. And all these cities are in the piece of land that we are referring to, the Ephraimite and the Manasite in the Northern Kingdom. And they do one more thing. In the summary list, in Joshua 12, they insert additional cities which are located there in the piece of land which is not described in the northern tradition. So let's summarize today's conversation about the conquest of Canaan. So we have uh, several traditions of conquest, the tradition in the book of Joshua, additional traditions in the book of Numbers. Joshua is Ephraimite. There's good reason to believe that the earliest conquest tradition comes from the north, and it deals with explaining the maximal borders of the kingdom, of the northern kingdom, in the 9th and 8th centuries BC. The expansion from the core, from the heartland of Israel in the highlands, to the north, to the northeast, to the southeast. This tradition was brought to Judah, possibly by Israelites after the fall of the northern kingdom, and was taken over by the scribes of King Josiah in the late 7th century BC. 
in order to explain and to be used for their ideology of the reconquest of Canaan under Judah and a, David, and a Davidite king in the late 7th century BC. All right, thanks for that discussion. Uh, looking forward to our next one. Me too.